Who knows what this Tuesday is? Two days from now. Who knows what it is? Anybody know? Oh, somebody got it right. It is not Halloween. Well, I mean it is, but not really. It's Reformation Day. So some of you might not know this, but we're all going to, in our church, dress up like Martin Luther. We're going to shave our head like a tonsure, Augustinian monk, and we're going to walk around in robes. But if you don't know what this is, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther, who was a, a German monk, went to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and nailed a piece of paper, a document to that door called the 95 Theses. Perhaps you've heard about that. It was 95 things, uh, critiques and calls for reform in the church, the Catholic church. He wasn't trying to start a separation or a new church. He was simply saying, we're getting some things wrong. We need to recover the gospel. We need to get back to, to the clarity of what the Bible teaches about these things. Sort of at the top of that list was, came to be known as the five solas of the Reformation. The Reformation spanned, by the way, that was the beginning, 1517, over 120 years, all of Europe, the United Kingdom. It swept through the world, really. And everywhere it went, it took on a little bit of a different character or flavor, but it was sort of characterized historically by these five solas. These are Latin phrases. And if, you're not, if this is not familiar to you and you feel like you're back in class, that's kind of fun, isn't it? First, sola scriptura. That means, uh, sola means alone or solely. The Bible alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola, sola Christo, Christ alone. And soli deo gloria for the glory of God alone. Now, here's what they meant by that. When they said the Bible alone, they didn't mean all I need is me and my Bible. I don't need anyone or anything else. What they meant is that you on your own needed to have access to God's word. You don't need a priest to interpret it for you. It needs to be given to you in your own language. And secondly, that the Bible alone is our sole ultimate authority for all matters of faith and life and worship. That doesn't mean there aren't other authorities. There are in life. What it means is our ultimate authority is the Bible alone. And then faith and grace alone. How is a person made right with God? We're made right with God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. By God's grace through your faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's how salvation happens. That's how you're put right with God. And then you enter into this life of all these things that he's called us to do. Christ, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and all for the glory of God alone. These are really foundational things for us today. And by the way, we call it the Protestant Reformation. Those reforms that he nailed to the door, that was the heartbeat of what we're a part of today. Well, you're a part of today. Maybe you didn't know that or ever think about that. So, you know, when somebody comes to the door and says, trick or treat, go, happy Reformation Day, and give them a Bible. No, that'd be, they'd be very disappointed. And, and some candy, too. But this, by the way, that first one, Sola Scriptura, that's why we preach the Bible around here. That's why we preach through whole books of the Bible around here. That's why we want you to read the Bible on your own and in groups. It's why we do the all-time bestseller book club, reading through chunks of the Bible together in community. That's why the Bible is so central to what we do. Because, as I prayed a moment ago in Hebrews 4.12, which we studied a few weeks ago, the Bible is living and active. The Bible is God's transforming word into your life. Some of those early reformers gave their lives, literally died, to get the Bible into your hands and mine, into our common language. We have so much access today. It's on your phone. You've got them stacked on shelves. People died to make that possible. God's word given to you. So before we get into the text this morning, let me just say, read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read it alone. Read it in the morning. Read it at night. Read it with other Christians. If all you're doing is the verse of the day on Twitter, that's fine. That's a starting place. But get the word of God into your life. If you're not doing that, get with the program. This is God's word to you. Do you want to know God? Perhaps you're here and you're investigating who he is. The best way is not once a week to evaluate the service like a consumer, but to get the word of God into your life. Okay, I'll stop. Uh, maybe the rumble's telling me enough with the Bible already. <laughs> Speaking of the Bible, let's open to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up toward love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, if you've been with us in this series we're in called Jesus is Greater, we've been focusing, and the writer of Hebrews has been focusing on the greatness of Jesus. He's been building this case for nine chapters. That Jesus is greater than the angels. He's greater than the universe. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than your great high priest. He's greater than Moses, than Abraham, than David. Jesus is greater than anyone or anything in all the universe. There has never been, there is not now, nor will there ever be anyone as great as Jesus. And then in chapter 10, he takes this turn. And for the next several chapters, we're going to see this. And he begins to talk about, okay, so what? Okay, so Jesus is great. So you intellectually and theologically believe that Jesus is the greatest. So what? What do you do with that? How does that translate into your life? What, what good is it for you to believe that Jesus is the greatest if it doesn't mean anything, if you don't live differently in light of that? And that's what he turns now and talks about. How do you live in light of the greatness of Jesus if you claim to follow him. In fact, verses 19 through 21, which we just read, are really a kind of a perfect summation of all that he's been talking about up to this point. Verse 19 says, we have confidence to enter the most holy place. We don't cower and grovel and wonder where we stand with God. We have confidence because of Jesus' greatness to enter into the most holy place. And verse 20, by a new and living way. The old sacrificial system in the Old Testament for these Jews was the dead way. It didn't give life. It had to be repeated every year over and over again. It could perfect no one, but Jesus has made a new and living way. In verse 21, we have a great high priest over the house of God. It's because of this new confidence in Jesus, this new living way of Jesus, and this new high priest who is Jesus, that then the writer of Hebrews says, okay, let's talk about how you live. Let's talk about your life. The order here is important before we move on to those things. And I, we get this wrong. I, I, last night I came here before the Saturday night service an hour early just to think and pray before the sermon. And there's a group that meets, one of our small groups meets here every th Saturday night before the service. They were in the glass room over there. They had their Bibles open. They were reading through Hebrews together. And I walked in and talked to them a bit. And they were struggling with this issue, this, the order of faith. Notice that writer of Hebrews puts first your relationship, then your responsibilities. First, your relationship with God, made possible by, with, through Jesus Christ, your access into God's favor and family. That's first, and that comes by faith in Jesus. Sola fide, sola gratia. Remember that? And then you enter into this life. Some of you grew up in traditions, faith traditions, where it was the other way around. First, get yourself together. First, get your life right. First, behave right. First, go to church, give, serve, pray the right prayers, do enough of that, and then God will invite you in. Then you'll be acceptable to him. That's not the gospel. The gospel is first relationship, then responsibility. And that's why he spends nine chapters talking about the greatness of Jesus and what he's done for us before he moves to talk about what we're supposed to do. Relationship before responsibility. And then you'll notice that right after that, he gives us these... Um, these series of let us commands, not lettuce and tomato, but let us. These series of phrases, let us do what? First, let us draw near. Verse 22, let us draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That sprinkling and washing language, that's simply talking, that's, that's temple language about the, old, the high priest's ritual, to sprinkle the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, with blood and to wash ritually before they entered in. It's just simply saying, that's all done now. All that stuff you Jews used to remember that had to be done over and over again, that is done in Jesus. You've been washed. You've been cleansed. So that's why we can draw near to God. This theme of drawing near is pervasive in Hebrews. In chapter 4, we're to draw near to the throne of grace. In chapter 6, we have the hope, of the anchor for our soul that enters in and draws us in. In chapter 9, verse 12, he entered in once for all and invites us to follow him. And in verse 19, we have confidence to enter the most holy place. Now, if you know anything about Old Testament history, remember the book of Hebrews is written to people who grew up Jewish and have converted to faith in Jesus Christ. But their background is knowledge of the Old Testament and Jewishness. 
So when they hear confidence to enter the most holy place or draw near to God, what do you think is in their mind? What are they thinking about? The temple, the holy place, and the holy of holies in the, inside the temple, which was separated, divided by a giant curtain. That's why we read a moment ago that it's open for us but the curtain, which is his body. That's what they think of. And in the Old Testament, you can't go in there. You can't draw near to God. Not that near. Because what would happen if you, as an average person, went into the holy place? Who's seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Your face melts. I mean, that's not exactly biblical, but it's close, right? Like, you can't go in there. That's the holiness of God. Who can go in there? Only the high priest. Only once a year. So when he says, draw, let us draw near to God, this is, it sounds nice and, you know, spiritual to us. This is radical. Let us draw near to God in full assurance of faith. C.S. Lewis, you knew he was coming, has this brilliant essay. I encourage you, you can Google this essay. It's called The Inner Ring. And he says, one of the uh, characteristics of human behavior in the human heart is the insatiable desire to be in the inner ring. He says, all of life has rings. Some of these rings are formal, like you have them at work. They're by title and structure and org chart and that kind of thing. You have them in sports. You have them in the military. Some of the rings are more informal, the in crowd. And even if you're at work and you're not in this group, you kind of know, well, that's where decisions get made. That's the group to be in. That's where the power is. You all know what I'm talking about. At school, which, who of you doesn't know about rings, right? And there's always this part of our hearts that wants to be in that ring, the next one. And once we get in that ring, we realize, oh, this is not what I thought it was. Oh, this is not so great. That's the next ring. And it just goes on and on and on. You know what I'm talking about. Even you moms have these rings, right? Socially, we have them. They're just, and, the, and the, Lewis says the desire isn't wrong itself. It's just misplaced. This desire in us that wants to be in, in with whoever we think is most influential, most powerful, the coolest, whatever, that is actually a desire to be in with God, to be right with God. And that's when the writer of Hebrews says, let us draw near, come into the inner ring with God, the ultimate inner ring, the ultimate place of acceptance and love and knowledge where he knows you fully and still loves you. That's what... Our desire to be in that ring in social circles or work circles is actually a desire to be known and loved by God. And the writer of Hebrews says, let's draw near. You can. That's the ring you can get in, and it's everything you ever wanted. I recently reread an old book, uh, Puritan book by John Owen. He, Puritan writing is sometimes hard to read. It's a lot of run-on sentences. But this book is really good, devotionally speaking. And he writes... Friendship is most maintained and kept by visits, and these the more free and less occasioned by urgent business. Huh? Here's what he means. Friendship is maintained by visits. That makes sense, right? How do you know if you have a friend? You spend time with them. If you had a friend that you reached out to, you texted, you called, you wanted to get together with them, and they, own, they were always canceling and always not showing up, but they only reached out to you when they needed something, a ride or some money, or you think, this isn't really much of a friendship. That's what he's saying. Friendship is, a, is kept up by visits, and those only when it's not urgent, like not when, only when you need something. And then he applies that to God. He says, we understand that on the human level. When it comes to our relationship with God, how are you going to have a relationship with God if you don't spend time with him, if you don't have visits, if you aren't in his word? A close friendship with God will only happen if you spend time, if you visit with him, and not just when you're in trouble or when you need something. And, and speaking of human friendships, do you have friendships in your life, friends in your life, that you're better because of them? People that you spend time with that, that challenge you. I don't mean that they're in your face necessarily, but just because of their character and who they are, it makes you want to be better. I can be a sarcastic person. I like to, you know, make little jokes and sometimes it's other people's expense. It's sort of, I think, a natural gear for me. It's not always that good. And, and I grew up in athletic circles where that's just what you did. I've got a couple of friends who I've never heard them talk bad about somebody else, ever. I want to be like that. I want to be the kind of person who makes other people feel good to be around. I want them to feel like they're the most important person. That's how God is to me and to you. Do you have people in your life that you, you're around them and you think, just by virtue of their character, I'm better for that? 
So you want to draw near them. You want to spend time with them, right? Friendship with God, ultimately speaking, is what do, that's what does it for us. When the writer of Hebrews says, let us draw near to God, it's not just biblical language for go to church. He's saying, draw near to him. It will change you. It will transform you. I'm an impatient person. Maybe you can relate. If you drove in the car with me, well, probably if I drove in the car with me, I'd drive better. But if you were invisible in the car with me, you'd see that I'm an impatient person. Right? And when I draw near to God, it slows me down. It reminds me that my agenda is not most important. I can be, I can be harsh. I can be critical. I can sometimes be unloving and, unfor- and, and hold back forgiveness. Maybe you can relate to that. I hold grudges sometimes. Do you? When I draw near to God, it reminds me of how much I've been forgiven. How could I not forgive this person? I can be a bit of a control freak. I like to have things my way, and I think that I can do it in my strength. Maybe you can relate to that. When I draw near to God, it reminds me that he's in control. I'm not in control. And it, it gives me peace, and I rest in that. When the writer of Hebrews says, draw near to God, he's saying, that's what changes you. That's what transforms your life. That's what makes you into the man or woman he created you to be. So draw near to him. Spend time with him. Visit him often. Nearness to God is what transforms you. And in the Old Testament, you couldn't do that. That's why this is so radical. He's saying you can. This is the new and living way. In verse 14 of chapter 10, he says that, for by a single offering he perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Meaning in the old system, it had to be perpetually offered. It didn't perfect anyone. It didn't accomplish it. It was always meant to point to the one who would come and do it once for all. Draw near to him. Second one, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast. Uh, Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. How do we do this? How do you hold fast our confession? I want you to notice something if you haven't already. These are communal commands, aren't they? He doesn't say, you should draw near. You should hold fast. You need to do this. He says, us. It's all corporate language. We do this. How? Well, one of the ways you hold fast, as we talked about, is reading your Bible, being reminded of what you believe. I think privately, your own personal devotion life, of course. But there's something that happens communally, together. I don't know if you experience that. I do every week. In fact, just just this week, um, I had helped organize a prayer event at our Mill Creek campus with some pastors and churches from the area. And I had a crazy week. Just so full, so busy. And on Friday afternoon, we finished hosting a conference here. I'd been at a conference Monday and Tuesday. We hosted a conference here. I did a funeral on Wednesday in between, and I was just fried. And I went home for a couple of hours before I had to go to this prayer event. My wife was on the couch, the fire in the fireplace. The dog was next to her. And I'm like, I want to stay here. You know, <laughs> I don't want to go there. So I, but I had to go because if I don't show up, it's like conspicuous. You could skip, but I can't skip. So I went to this thing. I went, I went to this event, right? And I had a bad attitude. I was grumbling. I don't know. It was so good for me. Something happens in corporate prayer. When we worship, we get in, clustered up in groups and prayed for our communities, our schools, our churches, and for each other. Something happens in community that doesn't happen in isolation. It just doesn't. I'm in a men's group on Tuesday morning. We meet at 5.30. There's a number of groups like this that meet uh, throughout the week. And we, these groups that have sort of birthed out of this little, I don't know what it is, movement of guys trying to hold each other accountable and memorize scripture. Every one of these groups begins every time they meet by reciting Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. I I don't, I've done that, I've recited that every Tuesday morning for about seven years. We all do it. There's something about saying it together and hearing men's voices early in the morning saying that in unison. It's like we're saying we want to be Psalm 1 men. Men planted by streams of water, the water of, of life of Jesus Christ and, and rooted deeply in his word. I could say it by myself and I do, but something together happens. It doesn't happen alone. So when he says, let us hold fast our confession, he's saying you really can't do this in isolation. You really can't do this just by yourself. You need each other. To be reminded of who I am, God is saying. And we need to be reminded frequently because we are forgetful people. 
C.S. Lewis writes about this in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, Christ works on us in all sorts of ways, but above all, he works through each other. We are carriers of Christ to one another. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men and women into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even teaching the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. <laughs> He's saying all of our churchifying is, is a total waste of time if it isn't drawing people closer to becoming more like Jesus Christ. And that does not happen in isolation. You don't get there on your own. If you're just coming to church a couple times a month, feeling, you know, inspired, like, like you know, and, you know, like on occasion you do something else. That's great. Keep doing that. But that is, that's not a, can you imagine if the, if the New Testament said things like, what you need most is to go to church for one hour, two times a month, and then you'll be good. Wouldn't that be hilarious if it said that? And I'm not, I mean, you're already here, so I'm not making you feel guilty, I hope. What I'm saying is it's not what we're, what we're called to is something much deeper than just attendance at a one-hour worship service. We need each other. You need people in your life who love you but love God more. Jonathan Wesley writes, the Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. Our culture does, but the Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. And that brings us to the last one. Let us one another. Now I know that's not grammatically correct, but it actually is theologically correct and I'll explain it. Let us one another. Let me read verses 24 and 25 for you again. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This phrase, one another, is used over 50 times in the New Testament. It's a single Greek word, a lelon, and it's, it's over and over again it's used in the New Testament. Forgive one another, love one another, bear with one another, encourage one another, serve one another. You can't one another by yourself, can you? You can't do those things on your own. And the first thing we're told here in verse 24 is, let us consider how to stir one another up toward love and good works. Let us consider. That's a very interesting word. The word consider means to think deeply about. And it means an individual. It means you and I thinking deeply about a person and considering how can I encourage them? How can I challenge them? What do they need from me to grow closer into the man or woman God made them to be? How can I help them do that? I've got a little discipline I started doing years ago. I write at least uh, four note cards a week to somebody. People, you know, texting is good and email is good, but nobody writes notes anymore. You get mail in the mail, it's usually a bill or it's just junk mail and you throw it out, right? Very, pe very few people actually get handwritten notes anymore. And I, I'm kind of a paper and a pen snob. I like those sorts of things. I use fountain pens. I know it's geeky, but I like that sort of thing. But so I just decided I'm going to write four notes a week at least. And I have to consider, who am I going to write to? What am I going to say? And why? You could do this. Who, who in my life needs an encouraging word, a challenging word? How can I help them? How can I encourage them? Consider how we might stir one another up toward love and good deeds. And by the way, the Greek phrase, stir up, your Bible might say spur on. You know what that actually means in Greek? It actually means um, to irritate or provoke. It's only used one other time in Acts chapter 15, and it's used to describe an argument, a fierce argument between Paul and Barnabas over whether or not they should keep this guy Mark on their team. So it actually is used negatively. So why would the writer of Hebrews use a term that's so rare and only used negatively here? What it, it, he's really saying, let us consider how we might irritate each other. <laughs> is it possible to be a good irritation? You know, something that you need to hear, you don't want to hear, but someone needs to say to you, and you'll listen to them? That's a good irritation. Have you ever had that experience? Somebody who's a good irritation in your life? A couple of years ago, a guy who was a close friend and accountability partner of mine was over at my house. I think I'd borrowed a tool or he borrowed a tool. I can't remember. There's a wrench involved. I know that. We were returning it or borrowing it. And he was in my driveway, and we were just talking after the passing of the wrench. <laughs> 
And my wife was upstairs in our, inside, and she called down to me from, uh, from our bedroom. And I don't remember what she said, but I remember it was something about something I hadn't done or needed to do. And I don't recall exactly, but I know what I did. When whatever she said, I remember I went like this. <clears throat> like that. Loud enough for my friend to hear, but hopefully not for my wife to hear. And my buddy kind of didn't say anything about it, and we went his way, and I went my way. And the next week when we got together on Tuesday morning, afterwards, he said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure, sure. He said, hey, you remember when I was in your driveway the other day? And I said, yeah, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> he said, well, when you groaned and kind of, you know, at your, at your wife's comment, he goes, man, I don't know if that was the best thing. And you know what I thought? Honestly, when I'm in a moment of confession. You know what I thought, I thought, hey, I'm the pastor. You're not supposed to tell me that stuff. I'm supposed to tell you that stuff. <laughs> That's what I thought. That was in my mind. <laughs> and he wasn't getting on, he wasn't over the top, but he just was saying, hey, listen, we're supposed to hold each other accountable. That's not a big deal, but that's not a good thing, you know? And he was, he was exactly right. It was a good irritation, stirring me up to be a better husband. You know, because that kind of stuff, that kind of resentment, you know, little, little, little irritations in our life, little resentments we have, little unconfessed things, they build over time. You know, nobody wakes up one day and says, I, I think today I'm going to ignore my wife and blow up my marriage. Nobody does that. But, you know, you, you just let little things go unchecked. They become medium-sized things. They become big things. They become huge things. And before you know it, you've got, you don't know how you got over here. Because nobody was telling you, hey, this is not good. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. You need that in your life. God wants to give you that in your life. That's why I say, you know, if you're just coming here once a week or, you know, or a couple times a month, then that's great, but it's not enough for you to become the man or woman God made you to be. You will not get there on your own. And notice in verse 25, he says, not neglecting meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. He uses a different word there. It's the positive side. We need both, don't we? We need both confrontation and support. We need both people to tell us and remind us that we're, we're loved, we're made in the image of God, that we're matter, that we have value, that we're better than we think we are. And we need people to tell us we're not as good as we think we are either sometimes. We need both. You need both. And some of you are better at one or the other, aren't you? Some of you here this morning are really good at the encouraging side. You love to encourage people. But you struggle to confront. Others of you are about to get an elbow in the ribs you are the ones who are, you're really good at pointing out people's faults. It's like a spiritual gift you have. You can just see the problems in other people, right? And you're not afraid to tell them. And churches can be this way. Really good at the confrontation side, but not so good at the grace side. You need both. One without the other won't change you. You need both. Let us draw near to God, he says. Let us hold fast our confession. And then let's encourage and stir each other up to become what God made us to be. I mentioned a minute ago that I, I, have a, I have a sarcastic side. You know, I think just playing sports and being on teams is kind of how guys show affection. We rip each other. I saw a friend I hadn't seen in 20 years. He's the defensive coordinator for Eastern Michigan University, and I went and did a chapel talk for their team. They were in town to play in Northern Illinois, and my good friend's the head coach, and he hired my old teammate who was the defensive coordinator. I hadn't seen Neil in years. And it was good to see him, and we, we, we talked, and we were kind of giving each other the business, and then my friend Chris, who's the head coach, said, Neil's defense is, and he was about to say doing great, but I interrupted him, and I said, a disaster? Like, just joking, you know? And Neil looked at me like, nothing's changed, you know? It's just what you do. You make fun of each other. But what if it was different? How many of you, sarcasm is your native tongue? Show of hands. It's just, yeah, okay, a few of you are like, I'm not putting my hand up, but you know, you're, how many of you feel your arm being pushed up by somebody else? If you walk through life this week and you just said, I'm going I'm to check every sarcastic impulse I have and only speak words of life and encouragement and love, your family would probably think something happened to you, right? What is wrong with you? Are you okay? It's so unusual in our culture, isn't it? it would be, you, you'd be thought of as weird if you went through th this week and you decided to encourage people. Dave Prost, our church chairman, told me a story about he was at one of his corporate uh, events where they gave out the awards, you know, and it was just kind of, he said, it was just depressing. It was all about performance and people didn't feel very encouraged. And he decided, you know what, I'm just, he's somebody, it was just a downer. And he started walking through the lobby of the hotel just telling people how much they mattered, how much he valued them, how glad he was on the, they, he was, they were on the team. He said it was like, one woman just started, broke down crying because nobody said that in their context. 
Nobody said those kinds of things. Let us consider how we might challenge, be good irritations, and how we might encourage one another toward love and good works. Then this last thing he says, let us not neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some. Now, now I, the temptation is to read this and think, oh, this is like a pastor's favorite verse. They can tell us we have to be in church. I, that's not, it doesn't only mean that. It means so much more than that. But I think it's interesting. Let us not give up on this, as is the habit of some. What gets you out of the habit of meeting together? Here, in corporate worship, in small groups, if you're in one, with other believers, what causes us to get out of the habit of meeting together? Now, I know normally you just stare straight ahead and don't say anything until it's over, and I say amen, and you go home. But actually, I want you to answer. What gets us out of the habit? Complacency? I think there's a t- life is fairly easy. We think we don't need it. What else? Busyness. How many of you, like, you've got tons of free time, and you just need to fill it? Anybody? Anybody? Like, I don't know what to do with my life. I have so much extra time. No hands. How many of you wish you had a little more margin in your life? Right? We're, it's, we live in a busy culture, a busy society. What else? Relationships. Sometimes they're hard. Sometimes I, I don't like this person. I don't, don't want to have to see them. And they're going to be there, so I won't go. Sometimes sin. Sometimes I think this is true. Sometimes we're dealing with something in our life that we know is off, we know is wrong, and we don't want to go to church because we're made to feel guilty about it. But that's actually a good irritation. We run away from the thing we most need when we most need it. I've told this story before, but a couple of years ago I was in Target or Jewel, I think, and I saw a guy that I hadn't seen in years. And the last time I saw him, we had a, we had a good irritation conversation about some stuff in his life. And I hadn't seen him in a while. I know he was running from God. And he saw me. And I saw him, and he saw that I saw him, and I saw that he saw that I saw, you know, the whole thing. Like, this, like all in a moment, oh, he looked down, and he was like, oh, no, he saw me. Listen, I, I wasn't going to go over there to that guy and go, you're a sinner. You know, come back to church. I love that guy. God loves that guy. But he didn't want to come back. Why? Because he doesn't want to face what he's dealing with. But that's what he needs. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast our confession. Let us consider how we might encourage each other. You know, sometimes it's small irritations. You know, we have these uh, comment cards on your, the tear-off portion. You know, have, you, have you noticed that? There's the, you can tear off that in the connection card. And if you're new and you want us to connect with you, please do that. Fill it out. Drop it as you leave. We'd love to follow up with you. But there's a backside that says comments. Sometimes people will put comments on there. Sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes they're not. <laughs> sometimes people sign their name. Sometimes they don't. Guess which people don't sign their name on the not-so-helpful comments, you know? It's hard to follow up with an anonymous comment. Sometimes, and I'm not making this up, in the same week we'll get comments like, this worship is too loud. It's not focused on God. And in the, in the, in the same week, thank you for the energy and the life and the vitality of the worship. Uh, no names, right? You know? <laughs> and sometimes those little things can become big things in our minds, and we're like, nah, I'm not going anymore. Look, again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty about church attendance. I'm trying to teach you what the Bible says. Let us not give up meeting together. Because everything in your life is pushing you away. Your busyness, your complacency, your relationships, just life in general, the drift is not toward this. You have to swim upstream. You have to fight for it. Let us draw near to God, because that's what will transform you. Let us hold fast our confession. Something happens when we come together that doesn't happen in isolation. And let us consider, meaning you are needed here. Somebody needs your encouragement and your challenge, and you need someone else's. Finally, friends, you need a community. You just simply will not become the man or woman God made you to be on your own. It will not happen. You can only get so far in isolation. You will not be who he wants you to be. A woman of love and grace and patience and kindness and gentleness, a man of integrity and faithfulness and truth and love and gentleness. That's not happening on your own. You can't get there by yourself. That's why he says, okay, since you, we've spent nine chapters talking about the greatness of Jesus, let me tell you the next most important thing. Stay together. Stay with each other. Don't give up on this. I know it's hard. I know it, life pushes you away. But you need each other to remind each other of who I am and who I've called you to be. That's what you do when you show up here. 
That's what I hope God gives to us as his people. Let's pray. Father, we pause and acknowledge that you are the greatest in all the universe, and we praise you for your goodness and your love. And we confess that we live in a culture that pushes us into isolation, that causes us to believe the myth of independence. None of us can make it on our own. And thank you, Lord, that you have not left us on our own. Help us by your spirit to draw near to you, to hold fast to our belief in you, and to consider how we might encourage each other to do the same. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.